Dr. Nick Rod. Uh, Nick and I go way back to his days when he first arrived as a fresh PhD student. Um, that was after actually studying uh, first the law um, and then physics at Melbourne University in his native Australia. Um, and then he went on to get both his bachelor's and his master's in physics uh, at Melbourne uh, with his master's thesis supervised by Ray Volkus and Elisabetta Barbiero. Uh, he then started his PhD at MIT with uh, Tracy Slatcher. And Nick went on to do an award-winning PhD thesis uh, on dark matter indirect detection. Um, and so that's basically just using uh, standard model decay or annihilation products um, of dark matter to just try to look for it. Um, and so he was awarded the Sakurai dissertation award for his, uh, award, his thesis work. Uh, and then he moved that same year to UC Berkeley to do um, a postdoc as a Miller fellow. Uh, Nick then went on to do a lot more great work on indirect detection, but also branching out into other areas. And I think we're gonna hear about some of those areas uh, today uh, when Nick tells us about uh, new ideas for the Axion Dark Matter program. And then as recently as a few months ago, uh, Nick uh, actually started as a, uh, a staff scientist at CERN in the theory division. So um, that's a little bit about Nick's background. Um, so we're very happy to hear about his science. So take it away, Nick. Thank you, Caitlin, for that um, extremely nice and surprisingly detailed uh, introduction. I very much appreciate it. Uh, so also thank you to all the organizers for the chance to come today. And thank you for everyone in the audience for coming along. Uh, it's very nice to be here again. As was mentioned, I was actually back there in, tw in 2016. So it's nice to see some familiar faces again. So actually, before I dive into the physics today, I really want to make a sincere apology. Uh, I got confused with the time zones earlier and unfortunately only made the very tail end of the discussion with the grad students, which I believe was scheduled for lunchtime today. So I heard it wasn't a total disaster because there was still free food provided. But uh, if anyone was hoping to chat to me and didn't have the opportunity because I got confused with the time zone, please just send me an email. I'd be very happy to chat at some other point. Uh, so what I want to tell you about today is a line of thinking that I've been following recently, where I'm just very excited about the possibility that the dark matter of our universe might be axions. And that if this is the case, then I think in the next 10 to 20 years, we may genuinely discover that that is what the dark matter of our universe is made of. But in order to get there, we're going to need some amazing instruments that are able to do some fantastic things. And so I've been thinking about what can we do to take advantage of those instruments? And I'm going to tell you about two of these ideas today. The first of them is to actually think about axions and wave-like dark matter more generally and try and understand what can we do on it if it really is a wave. And, and one possibility is to do something that we do on waves all the time, and that is to really exploit the k.x part of the phase or the spatial dependence and, and, and perform interferometry. And so I'll describe the idea of performing interferometry directly on the dark matter wave and also explain what's happening in this animation uh, in the bottom left of the slide uh, about halfway through the talk. And in particular, I'll be describing some work that was done in collaboration uh, with Josh Foster, Yoni Khan, Rachel Wynn and Ben Safdie. Secondly, in the last part of the talk, what I'm going to be telling you about is uh, the possibility that these instruments that were designed to search for dark matter may inadvertently discover something that they never even anticipated, and that is an axion analogue of the cosmic microwave background that we dubbed the cosmic axion background. And so I'll explain to you how such a possibility could even be conceived and how this could show up. But before getting into these specific ideas, I mean, I'm already hoping to talk about a lot, let me be a little bit more ambitious and, and, and really appreciate the fact that not everyone in this audience uh, spends all of their time thinking about axions. So I firstly just wanna take a step back and sort of frame the overall problem of dark matter and explain to you where axions fit within this and also tell you about this exploding program searching for axion dark matter that the research that I'll tell you about today was really um, building upon. So let me go right back to just the fundamental idea of dark matter and just remind you why I think this is such a compelling problem. And so at least in my mind, our modern understanding of dark matter really goes back to observations of our nearest neighbor in the universe, the Andromeda galaxy, which I'm showing you at the center of the slide here. So back in the late 1960s, and then in a paper that was published in 1970, uh, Vera Rubin and Kent Ford were making observations of the Andromeda galaxy. And they were trying to make the following um, uh, observation. They were trying to look at various objects that they could measure within the system and try and determine what is their rotational speeds around the center of the galaxy. 
So we can make a rough prediction for this. There really should be um, error bars on this. This is a theory prediction. Um, but the idea should be that roughly, um, just from our understanding of classical gravity, as we move further and further out uh, from the center of the system, you can just see by eye that the amount of matter that's there is dissipating. It's becoming easier or more transparent. It's easier to see through. And so because of this, there isn't enough mass uh, to keep up with the fact that we're moving farther away from that mass. And so the rotational speed should drop off. And so you can see this on either side, uh, the, the magnitude of the rotational velocity is tending towards zero. However, when they made their observations, quite famously, instead of seeing this, this value head to zero as we move beyond all the mass we can see, it's just plateauing. You can see it's heading towards this roughly constant value of 200 kilometers per second. Uh, and in fact, it seems to be plateauing out beyond where we can see any matter. It's almost as if there is a huge amount of matter in this system um, that we just cannot see by eye. And indeed, this we now know is, was the first piece of evidence towards this, this idea of dark matter. And in the 50 years since those initial observations, what we found is that almost everywhere we look throughout the universe, there seems to be evidence for dark matter. If we look at larger scales than galaxies towards collections of galaxies, which are galaxy clusters, then for example, objects like the collision uh, in the famous instance of the bullet cluster uh, gives additional evidence for dark matter. If we look out at the, uh, all the structures we see in the universe, essentially the, the entire theory of structure formation, really at its heart requires some sort of cold dark matter candidate. And even if we look back to some of the earliest times in the universe, our exquisite um, uh, agreement between theory and data in the, uh, that we see in the cosmic microwave background is underpinned by the um, uh, uh, insertion of a, a cold dark matter candidate again. And so what we're seeing from all of these uh, pieces of evidence is that we can make quite quantitative predictions that actually we need an additional source of matter in our universe. This is the dark matter, and it needs to make up about 84% of the mass, so the majority. So everything that we can see around us only makes up a fraction of the mass that we know should exist in the universe. So I'm coming from to this problem with a particle physicist perspective. So you're not going to be surprised to find that I tell you that the solution is we need to add a new particle. That's what this whole problem is going to be solved by. And if you haven't thought about this before, you may immediately balk at that and say, well, this is ridiculous. Like the, the, the smallest scale you're seeing a deviation is on galactic scales. And you're telling me that the resolution to this is in your field of research, which focuses on subatomic states. But of course, to remind you, I don't think this is anywhere near as ridiculous as it might initially sound, because everything we can see in these images, indeed, everything we see around us, we know to be made of particles. This is the great success of the atomic hypothesis. And fundamentally, the, the, the real miracle of particle dark matter is that adding just a single state to the standard model, although often we have more complicated uh, uh, models for it, can really bring all of these observations back to be consistent with our, uh, our theory. There are many ways that we can actually make this work. So this all sounds fantastic. The, the particle physicists have come along and solved this problem. We just add a new particle, and then that will be what the dark matter is, and we'll explain all these mysteries that we have in the universe. The challenge is if you then start getting more specific and asking questions like, well, what is that particle? And let me now just turn to a single question you might ask about a particle, and that is, what is its mass? And the, the honest answer is we have almost no idea what the mass of the dark matter particle could be. I'm showing you here a possible range for where the dark matter masses could be on this, this uh, uh, ruler of particle mass here. It's going from about 10 to the minus 10 EV up to the Planck scale, which is about 10 to the 28 EV. And just for reference, the particles that we know about in the standard model are what is shown in this orange box at the top. So they only occupy a fraction of this. And even if we extend that to include the much lighter neutrinos, uh, this only goes down a few more orders of magnitude. You can see that uh, this range of dark matter mass vastly eclipses it. And actually, I mean, I'm, I've hugely truncated this just for um, presentation purposes. Truly, actually, the full range of dark matter mass goes all the way from about 10 to the minus 22 EV, so many orders of magnitude to the left, and all the way up to about 10 solar masses, so many, many, many orders of magnitude to the right. So this is um, uh, even then an, an, an approximation to the, to the true story. And so you can see the fact that it could live anywhere along this mass range makes this quite a challenging problem, but also a very interesting problem because at different mass ranges, uh, the phenomenology or the behavior of that dark matter particle can be fundamentally different. And in particular, while historically we've actually really focused on ideas where dark matter would be somewhere near the masses of the standard model particles, where we had uh, very good motivations, for example, uh, ideas like the hierarchy problem motivated that there should be a particle around the electroweak scale to try and which would be associated with resolving the other mysteries we have around the electroweak scale. But so far, nothing's shown up there. So an idea that has really become popular in the last decade or so is actually dark matter might be much lighter. 
And the reason why this is quite interesting is at least in the model space, uh, the dark matter sort of goes through a phase transition where no longer should you think about the dark matter that we know should exist around the location of the Earth as a gas of particles, as it normally is. And this is how we search for it, for example, in direct detection. We're looking for one particle to come in and bounce off uh, a particle we can see and try and measure that. Instead, actually, as you get lighter and lighter, there are more and more particles around. And so this means that actually they begin, the de Broglie wavelengths begin to overlap and it actually starts to behave like a classical wave. You sort of have a transition that you might be familiar with from the electromagnetic spectrum, where very high energies like gamma rays, you think about the um, individual photons as, as really the relevant way of describing the system. But on the other end, if we move to much uh, lower energy photons, uh, for example, radio, we there think about a classical wave as a much more accurate description of what's going on. And indeed, the same phenomena happens for dark matter. At this lighter end, it really should behave like a wave. And so what I'm going to focus on today is the idea that dark matter could be a wave and just describe some of the basic um, uh, ideas that had been overlooked in the literature that we can uh, consider taking advantage of this hypothesis. In particular, I want to be a bit more specific. Now, there are a number of different ideas for what a wave like dark matter could be uh, made of, but actually one candidate has really emerged as sort of the, 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 the theorist's favourite in, in many senses. This is the, the candidate that people are really focusing on this wave like end, and it's something that is called the axion. So many of you are familiar with it, but for those of you who aren't, there are other reasons for liking the axion. In, in particle physics, we like our uh, new states to solve multiple problems, and in addition to potentially being the, axi uh, the dark matter, the axion could also solve some other problem uh, particle theorists worry about called the strong CP problem, but I won't focus on that today. Instead, just starting from this particle physics perspective, the idea is that the axion would add um, potentially multiple more, but at least uh, we would often expect this following addition to the uh, standard model Lagrangian, which is a coupling between the axion A and FF tilde, where F is the, um, the field strength of electromagnetism. So this is the way that particle physicists often write these types of terms down. But what is much more, I think, intuitive is to, to think, well, if this particle is coupling to electromagnetism, well, then it should give um, some modification to the laws that govern electromagnetism, and that's Maxwell's equations. And indeed, you can sit down and calculate that the addition of this uh, uh, Lagrangian term makes three modifications to electromagnetism. Essentially, it adds new sources for the fields. So in, in Gauss's law, we get an additional sort of effective uh, charge that is added in. This is this term on the first line. And then to, to the Ampere-Maxwell law, we get two additions which behave as essentially effective currents uh, that, that are being sourced by the axion. So you might notice that the, the uh, contributions here uh, come in two qualitative flavors. I mean, there's different ways to slice and dice these additions, but let me just make the following distinction. You will see that two of the contributions come in with gradients of the axion, whereas, whereas one of them comes in with a time derivative. And the reason why this is uh, uh, conceptually important is because the derivatives will pull out uh, the, the momentum of the state, whereas the time derivatives will pull out the energy. Uh, and so because we know that dark matter, at least around the location of the Earth, should be non-relativistic, uh, the momentum of this state will be much lower than the energy, which will be dominated by its mass. And so that actually means if you're looking for axion dark matter, you only need to worry about one of these three additional terms, and that is the last one on the final line. And so if you just look at this qualitatively, what you see is that if you have a magnetic field and you also have an axion around, what is happening is that this will look very much like an, a current that is there, which is also in the um, Ampere-Maxwell equation. And so the idea is that even if you have no current in your system, the presence of a magnetic field and the presence of an axion will induce a current and therefore induce other effects, like for example, an oscillating magnetic field that you can go and look for uh, in a very sensitive detector. So this is the fundamental idea that really the whole axion dark matter program uh, is built on, at least a large part of it. And so now let me tell you what we've been able to do with this idea and what the progress is and where we're going in the future. Okay, so first, before I start adding um, uh, our current progress and where we're going, let me just outline the, the landscape of axion dark matter as I see it at the moment, at least through its coupling to electromagnetism. So what I'm showing you on the x-axis is the mass of the axion. Now, what you can see is this is a logarithmic axis and I've got 19 orders of magnitude here. So this is just a, a micro version of the general problem we have in dark matter that we just have no idea exactly what the mass is. But this is true even for the axion, uh, it could exist over a, a very wide range of masses. What I'm showing you on the y-axis is how strong does this axion couple to electromagnetism? The stronger it couples, intuitively, the, the easier it's going to be able to um, uh, detect experimentally. 
And technically this coupling has uh, dimensions because uh, the Lagrangian term at the top is dimension five. So this GA gamma gamma has to have units. And so I've just given it units of inverse energy here. So having introduced the, um, the axes here, and also just one thing I would say, what I'm going to be talking about in the next couple of slides is something that is based on a fantastic resource for um, the current uh, uh, status of Axion searches. It's this GitHub uh, created by Kieran O'Hare. And if you haven't seen this before, I have a link on the, the bottom right of the slide. I really encourage you to go and have a look if you're interested in this at all. Um, really quickly, Nick, um, we had a question in the chat um, from Robert asking what was uh, determining the cutoff on the lower mass end. Good. So for um, uh, so th I mean, th there's a slightly technical answer for that. If we're thinking more generally uh, about ALPS, then you can uh, uh, think about much lighter masses than what I'm showing you here. Uh, and indeed, as um, I, I suspect Rob is well aware, you can go all the way down to 10 to the minus 21 or that order uh, in mass before you run into other constraints. However, if you're thinking about this really um, a particular idea that is related to the QCD axion, as I'll mention briefly, the mass is uh, inversely proportional to the uh, decay constant. And if I think it's at around 10 to the minus 12 of the mass, the decay constant hits the Planck scale. So that's sort of a natural place to, to draw the dividing line on the left there. But if you think more generally about axion-like particles, you can push this plot to the left. I'm, I'm just, um, again, for the sake of presentation, trying not to show all the orders of magnitude here, but that's a fair question, thanks. Good, so now let me start putting some uh, actual uh, results onto this, this white plot. We, we, I mean, it's a challenging problem. We've done better than what I'm, I'm showing you so far. So firstly, if an axion just exists in the universe, independent of whether or not it's um, uh, dark matter, we can say something about it. And that is because through its coupling to electromagnetism, you can imagine in various objects uh, throughout the universe, you could be just producing this axion. For example, once you now have a coupling between a new state and photons, in other processes where you have photons around, you can also imagine uh, uh, the axion being produced. And this can be a very important mechanism because this particle interacts very weakly. If you produce it, generically it will just free stream out of the object and not interact again. So for example, you can start imagining you have a new cooling mechanism for stars because these states are produced and just carry the energy away. And given our you know, reasonable understanding of these stellar objects, we can't just have huge amounts of additional cooling added into them without being inconsistent with um, uh, uh, our understanding of those objects. So you can essentially set bounds based on that to the, the coupling of electromagnetism. Or alternatively, you can actually go and look for these axions are coming out of stars. And there's a famous example of this, which is the CAST instrument, which looks for axions coming out of the sun. Uh, and this is essentially, it's an LHC um, uh, dipole magnet that uh, wasn't, uh, was either, for whatever reason, wasn't put down in the, uh, the tunnel, maybe it was a spare. Uh, and what they've done is they then move this around throughout the day, pointing it at the sun. And in the strong magnetic field, um, uh, thanks to this coupling at the top, the axon can convert back into a photon that we can look for and they haven't seen anything. And so they can set a bound. And so generically, just the existence of the axion uh, is inconsistent uh, with the values here. And you can see at some point, these bounds begin to cut off as I go to higher masses. And the reason for that is that eventually the, the mass of the particle is so high that I just don't have enough energy in these systems, whatever the temperature are to produce the state. So that's where these bounds begin to cut off at the top. But luckily on the right-hand side of these plots, I have another bound. And this is coming from the fact if the now I require additionally the axon exists and it's dark matter, well then at, at the high end, if it um, has this coupling to electromagnetism, it can decay to two photons. And if we're at around this, this KV and up range, the photons that you'll be producing would be X-rays. And we're generally quite good at searching for um, X-ray photons. So we can set very strong constraints on this, as you can see uh, on the, the right-hand side here. You might notice uh, right towards the bottom, there's a little island coming out at 10 to the four uh, EV or 10 KV that's highlighted in blue. This isn't completely random. I've highlighted it because it's um, a result of my own work. But actually, I just wanted to give you a flavor of where these types of constraints were coming from. Actually, what we were doing in the, this paper here was we were considering constraining a totally different type of dark matter, which is sterile neutrino dark matter, which is also known to decay to give you an X-ray um, uh, line. Uh, but at the end of the day, after our focus on um, uh, the, the sterile neutrino dark matter, we realized that these same limits can be reconverted into um, searches for axion dark matter and actually turned out to be quite competitive. That's what I'm showing you down here. But generically, just to give you a flavor, where these strong constraints are coming from is from X-ray observations often uh, um, looking for anomalous lines. 
So that is sort of the boundaries of the space. It can't be too high and it can't be too massive. Otherwise you run into these, these uh, uh, non-observations. But that still leaves, I mean, it's a log log plot. It still leaves a lot of orders of magnitude to search for. And I mean, even here, I'm lying a little bit as, as Robert correctly pointed out, the plot extends to the left, but let's, let's just stick to this for the moment. So what would be helpful if we're going to experimentalists and saying, can you please have a look um, uh, to, for this axion particle is to at least give them some idea what our best guess is for where it could live. And actually it turns out if this axion also solves the strong CP problem, because this is a problem related to the strong force, we know that the axion then must have couplings related to that strong force. And indeed, actually these couplings induce a mass for the axion and, and through a, a series of procedures induce a relationship between the strength of its coupling and its mass. And it's an inverse relationship, which uh, shows up as this line that I'm giving you, this yellow line through the middle of the plot here. Now there's some theory uncertainty on this. It depends exactly what the, the full model of the axion looks like. And that's why I'm not just showing you a single line, I'm showing you a band and two particularly well-motivated or at least historical models there are called the KSVZ and the DFSZ. And that's what I'm showing you as the specific lines here. But at least this lays down a target that if you really wanna see what we think is the best guess for what axion dark matter should be, you wanna hit this parameter space. So how are we going on that? Well, what, the, the generic program of searching for this is looking for the axion dark matter that makes up the halo of the Milky Way. So these instruments are called axion haloscopes. And at the moment, we're very good for masses around um, uh, a micro EV, which is about 10 to the minus six. In particular, the ADMS collaboration, you can see it's already um, pushed into some of the most interesting parameter space. Now, you may have been following this. If you haven't, I'll just tell you they haven't seen dark matter yet. You probably would have heard about it otherwise, but they really are pushing into some of the most interesting parameter space. And you can see there are a number of other instruments around there that are pushing down into that space and, and will certainly get there shortly. You'll also note that on the lower end, there are these instruments, Abra 10 centimeter and shaft uh, that honestly at the moment um, uh, are not particularly impressive in their reach. And the reason for that is they're not even getting below these star emission bounds. But these instruments have made the additional assumption that the axion is dark matter, which is a strong assumption and was not even present in the star emission bounds I showed you previously. So there's two reasons for highlighting um, uh, the, these um, uh, results at the low end. I mean, one of them is the fact that I'm involved in one of them. Uh, and actually uh, the abracadabra results we had at the moment in certain parts of the parameter space, it's not totally clear by eye, but we are actually cutting below uh, at least the cast results, which are uh, this uh, a magnet that's pointing at the sun I told you about earlier. So which I think was a real landmark for these types of searches that we were able to achieve this. But honestly, the, the much more re um, uh, a scientific reason for, for pointing these out to you is the fact that these are really proof of principle instruments that you can search for axions at these much lower masses. These are quite small. It's about a 10 centimeter instrument that is doing this search at the moment. And the, what has been demonstrated is that these instruments have a very powerful volume scaling. So as you make these instruments bigger and bigger, the sensitivity scales very strongly with volume. And in fact, the ambitious plan of a larger version of one of these instruments, which will be called dark matter radio, is to cover the entire parameter space that I'm showing in blue, hopefully in the coming decades. And so you can see this will cover a large part of the very interesting parameter space uh, that previously we didn't really have instruments that would work for this. These types of cavity instruments like ADMX cannot just be pushed to lower masses. It just doesn't work this way. But that's just one instrument that there's gonna be progress on. Actually, we have ideas that will be covering a number of parts of this. Uh, you can see ADMX will get better. There are other instruments like Alpha. Uh, also a future version of CAST called IAXO will come along. Uh, and there are also other instruments, I'm just showing you a subset here that I think really in the next uh, uh, decades, we will cover a, a large fraction of, of this, this QCD prediction. And I think there's every reason to believe that we could finally begin to resolve what the dark matter of our universe is made of. And so it's with this really exciting progress that I think is on our horizon that I, I turn to the work that I was involved in, which was really trying to take advantage of these enormous leaps we're going to have in, in, in the years ahead. I can see there might be one more question on the chat, although maybe that was a comment. Uh, yes, Adrian asked what was up with the literal loophole around, uh, I guess, MA of 10 to the minus nine EV, yeah. Yeah, good. Uh, thank you for pointing that out, Adrian. It's about 50% of the time I show this while I get asked about this, because it really is a, a bizarre uh, feature of this. Actually, what these constraints are coming from is the Fermi gamma ray instrument. So um, 
you, you may be aware that very high energy photons do not uh, freely propagate through the universe. Through interactions with, um, for example, even the CMB, they can create an E plus E minus pair, and so they wouldn't reach the, the location of the Earth. But actually what can happen is that um, along their propagation, if an axion exists, this photon can convert to an axion. The axion is unimpeded for a long time, and then it can convert back to a photon. So you can end up seeing more, um, uh, more easily particles than you would otherwise. Or at least um, these types of interactions can lead to a, a variation in the, the spectral shape that you would expect to see. So what Fermi does is they look for um, uh, the objects of known spectra, for example, these predicted spectra, and then try and look for deviations that the axion might induce in this. But these, depending upon the magnetic fields in the system, these can be quite complicated. And my understanding from the paper was that a Poisson fluctuation in their data set uh, very, is reasonably well described by the axion parameters that are right in the center of the hole. Now, it's not that that's very strongly preferred, like it's just a mild excess there of the Poisson fluctuations, but actually it was such that they couldn't set a limit right in the center of the parameter uh, space is exactly what happened there. So I, I suspect unless an axion really um, lives there, and I, 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 I doubt it does, honestly, I don't have a lot of theoretical prior in that space, we'll close that eventually, but at the moment, uh, essentially a Poisson fluctuation uh, has prevented us from doing that. Good, so as I said, what I wanna do is talk about some ideas to take advantage of this. The first of these is that I wanna take this idea that the dark matter is behaving like a wave really seriously and think about what other things do we do with waves that we're not yet doing with the dark matter. And the one I wanna to describe to you is performing interferometry on the wave. And secondly, as you saw, the improvements we're gonna have in these instruments is obscene, like many, many, many orders of magnitude below what we've achieved previously. A question that my Clara's and I became interested in recently is when you start looking at these exceptionally small powers that would be deposited by the, these very low, uh, tiny coupling axions, is there anything else that might end up uh, showing up at these instruments when you're, you're probing such small values? And I indeed, I believe the answer is yes, and, and that would be, for example, a cosmic axion background. Good. So now let me turn to this idea of dark matter interferometry. So again, let me just review the basic picture that the um, dark matter would be behaving like a wave. So the picture to have in mind is we have the earth and, and, and shown on top of this is a very futuristic version of one of these um, uh, instruments. I'm not sure we'll get the funding to make something so large, but that's just for presentation. And the idea is, is that if you have this enormous magnetic field in one of these instruments, you will source an additional current if there is this axion passing through the earth because that's what makes up dark matter. So the zeroth order description for the axion is to just think that it's essentially just a classical wave oscillating uh, mostly dictated by its energy because it's non-relativistic, which is set by its mass. So you can just think about it as oscillating in time controlled by uh, whatever the mass is. And again, the fundamental challenge is we don't know what that mass is. But of course, if this is a wave, its phase structure will be more complex. It will actually have a time dependence that is set by the full energy, not just the mass. And then there will be a spatial dependence also, which will be controlled by the wave vector in general. So let me zoom in on both of these parts. If we focus on the energy, well, if you actually were able to resolve an axion and take a, um, uh, uh, take a Fourier transform of it, so you can look at how much power it has uh, at any given frequency, you wouldn't just see a delta function at its mass, you would eventually see the next correction to this, which is the famous a half mv squared. And so from this, you could actually resolve what the distribution looks like. And this is what I'm showing you on the, the bottom left. It's very narrow, but it has a finite um, uh, width. But just let me make a very trivial observation about um, a half mv squared. And that is the fact that half mv squared has no information about which direction the velocity is coming in. The axion dark matter is predominantly coming from one direction because we know the Earth is moving through the halo of dark matter as it orbits around the center of the Milky Way. But if you're just measuring the energy, you don't get that information out. You get some value about the magnitude of that velocity, but not its direction. However, if you were able to measure the k dot x part of the phase, you would get that information because for a non-relativistic state, k is um, uh, just the momentum or the mass times the velocity. And so you would actually get the full three velocity coming out of that. But it's challenging to see. If we just look at this and try and think of what ways could we measure the k? Well, firstly, you could imagine taking a derivative of it to pull the k out into the amplitude. But as I mentioned to you earlier, these derivatives will be smaller than any time derivatives, which will also generically be there. Uh, they'll be down by a factor of the, the dark matter velocity, which we think is about 10 to the minus three. So this is already a hard problem. We're making it harder by looking for this K term. So it's challenging, but maybe possible. Okay, you say, well, maybe we'll just go back to the phase and try and look for it there. 
But actually, you can convince yourself that the phase really isn't doing anything for us, because we could always choose our, our coordinates such that the location of our instrument is at x equals zero, and then this phase just disappears. Uh, and so that reveals it to be unphysical. And more generally, you can convince yourself that this k dot x doesn't do anything for one instrument. However, and I mean, again, given that this is really the spatial variation of the, uh, of the, 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 the wave, it shouldn't be too surprising. If we have two spatially separated detectors, there is then a vector in the problem that you can now just remove by um, a clever choice of coordinates. And that is the spatial separation between the two instruments. And then by combining the information between the two instruments, you could hope to get some information about this k dot x. And that's exactly what we want to do with this interferometry. So what we did in our paper was we said, let's imagine you had n instruments located around the earth. How could they combine their data optimally in order to um, actually make parameter inference about uh, exactly what direction the dark matter is coming in? I won't go through all of the details today. Instead, let me, well, let me tell you about just one output of our uh, calculation. And that is that the speed distribution, which actually is what was controlling the width of the distribution in the uh, frequency or energy domain I showed you on a few slides ago, gets modified to this calligraphic F object I'm showing you at the top of the slide. So there's a couple of details in this interval expression, but I'll try and walk you through it because actually all of the magic of interferometry is hiding in the single expression here. So what you can see, it's an integral over the full three velocity of the velocity distribution. We have a delta function at the end, uh, constraining the magnitude of that velocity back to the speed because this is a replacement to the speed distribution. And then what we have in the middle is a cosine of k, which for the non-relativistic state is m, dot, uh, m times v, dotted into the physical vector in the problem, which is the physical separation between the two instruments, x1, 2, which I've defined, defined below the earth on the right. So let's just run some sanity checks of this expression. If I put the two detectors on top of each other, well, the, the um, spatial part can't be important anymore. And indeed, cosine of zero is one. And so then this whole integral just collapses back to the speed distribution. So that, that's good, that, that makes sense. What if I move the two instruments infinitely far apart? Well, then this cosine just oscillates rapidly. And in general, I wouldn't expect to get any more uh, information out of this. So if this idea is gonna work at all, it's not gonna work in either of those two limits. There has to be some sweet spot in between where we can actually run this interferometry procedure. And it turns out when you do the calculation that it's the coherence length that dictates uh, where you want to put the two instruments. And the coherence length is the inverse of the mass times the velocity dispersion of the, the axion distribution. So you can say, well, that's great, but what is the, the coherence length? If it's from here to Andromeda, I, I'm not gonna get funding to set that up. What is the actual practical values you get out? Well, it turns out for instruments in this resonant cavity region I told you about, like ADMX or Haystack, the coherence length is order tens of meters. So there you could actually imagine building multiple instruments in the same laboratory to perform this interferometry. If you're at the much lighter end where, for example, dark matter radio will be provide, uh, probing, then you'd need instruments separated at hundreds of kilometers. But that's possible. We could imagine building them either on a same continent or maybe around the world, uh, which is often what we end up doing for interferometry anyway. And then what I'm showing on the bottom right is just pictorially what I was showing previously, that uh, in either limit, it either goes to zero or it goes uh, back to F of V, which is the black dash curve. Uh, but there's this sweet spot in between, which is the orange, which staring by eye, it might not be obvious that there's more information here, but uh, coming up with a full likelihood formalism and uh, you can actually, uh, without too much thought, uh, do parameter inference on that. So before I just tell you how fantastic this all is, let me be honest about the fact that there is a fundamental problem that is hiding in this expression I showed you here. And that is that there is a degeneracy. It's because all that is entering into this cosine is a dot product between the velocity and this physical vector um, x12. Let me try and demonstrate this to you with this image I have on the bottom right here. What I'm doing here is I'm asking, what is the incident direction of the dark matter on the celestial sphere? And then I've unwrapped the celestial sphere into this mole weed projection that I have in the, the middle of the slide. And I've, I've made the true location the very center of the map. What I've then done is I put one detector at the south pole, one detector at the north pole. So the detector axis runs uh, north south. And then I've said, how well can I determine which direction the dark matter is coming from? And you can see from the heat map, which is telling me which is the most likely area, I'm constrained to the equator. I can't be anywhere um, other than away from that. So this is an improvement over one instrument, which couldn't tell me anything on the sky, but it's a little bit unsatisfying that, that we can't get away from that. But this is, I mean, again, the reason this is coming in is because the dot product of v dot x12 is left invariant if I do rotations around the x12 axis. And again, this goes right back to the fact that what we're probing is the k dot x phase of the wave. This is really fundamental to the problem. It's not just some degeneracy that is manifested by a particular way of analyzing it. It's really a fundamental part of the physics. 
So this seems a bit disappointing. How are we going to get around this? I mean, maybe you could imagine having an array of multiple instruments, or maybe you can put your instrument on a truck and drive it around to try and get different X12 vectors. I mean, all of these seem expensive and challenging. Luckily, however, um, nature breaks this degeneracy for us. And that is because the Earth does not sit in the rest frame of dark matter. And so for two instruments located on the surface of the Earth, Throughout a 24 hour period, this X12 vector spans out a large space and over time will fully break this degeneracy. In fact, you can really see what, what's happening if you just look at sort of the, the, the signal shape that you get out, which is roughly what I'm showing you on the bottom right here. It will undergo large um, uh, variations throughout the day because of this, this daily modulation effect I'm showing you here. So essentially what you get in your signal shape is a genuine daily modulation that is qualitatively very different to the type of daily modulation that you may have heard of previously in the context of, of particle-like direct detection. It's a really wave uh, phenomena that is manifesting here uh, in this daily modulation. Okay, so now let me turn towards uh, like actually doing something practical with this. I've told you there's this problem, how to resolve it. Now can we actually do things with this? So firstly, could we actually resolve which direction the dark matter is coming from um, uh, with two instruments? And sort of a toy example is what I'm showing you here, where the, the, the distribution is what is in the, the orange box on the bottom right. Again, the heat map is telling me what the most likely region is. The, the literal definition is given under the images here, but intuitively um, uh, it has to depend on how bright the signal is. If the signal is just emerging, then it's going to be hard to, to make you know, detailed parameter inferences about all its properties. As it becomes brighter and brighter, I'll be better able to do these types of uh, inferences. And I'll make that more precise in a slide or two. But what you can see on the left image here, and again, the truth location is the center of the map. In the left image, I've placed my two detectors on an equal line of um, uh, latitude. So they're east, exactly east-west of each other. And on the right, I've placed them on an equal line of longitude. So they're exactly north-south of each other. So you can see on the right, I've correctly identified um, um, the, the, um, the incident position as the center of the map. But on the left, I have, but there's this other point up in the top right. And you might ask, is that an equal maxima to the point here? Is it just by eye, is it looking that? But yes, you can calculate it's an exact equal maxima. So what's going on here? I thought the degeneracy was lifted. Why are we still finding um, um, this appearing in our uh, uh, images here or our results? And that is because if you place um, uh, two detectors on an equal line of latitude, throughout the day, the X12 vector doesn't map out the full three space. It just maps out a plane. And then if I take the incident velocity and invert it across that plane, I have no way of distinguishing these two scenarios. Again, it's, it's, it's an exact degeneracy. And this is what is manifesting uh, on the left here. But we know of this ahead of time. You just tell the two instruments, please don't put them exactly on a, um, an equal line of uh, uh, latitude. As long as it's a bit off, you'll break this and you'll be able to pick one over the other. So with that in mind, let's say tomorrow Haystack discovers dark matter, which is one of the, these halescopes. Let me ask a question. How well could they determine which direction it's coming in at with just one day of data? And to remind you, um, uh, with one instrument, sorry, with two instruments and one day of data. With one instrument, you can't determine at all where the dark matter is coming from. Actually, we did a, um, a Monte Carlo simulation of this, and we found that with our formalism, with one day of data, you can determine the direction to one degree accuracy on the sky. So this isn't just some subtle effect um, uh, that, that, that we're seeing here. It's really, again, this, this type of daily modulation you saw induces large changes in the shape of the signal. And using our parameter inference, you can actually really narrowly point down, uh, pin down the, the various parameters of the, the underlying distribution. Finally, you can ask more complicated questions like what if the dark matter isn't just the simple phase-phase uh, -face distribution that we expect near the location of the Earth? What if it came in, for example, a lot of it in, a, in an ultra-coherent stream? Now, personally, I don't think that this is very likely, but just as a toy scenario to test out what would happen with our formalism. Well, again, what I'm showing you for, for dark matter incident on the Earth um, in some direction that is the center of the map in an ultra-coherent stream, how well can we infer it if we have detectors separated, um, again, east-west on the left and north-south on the right? What I'm showing you at the moment is data taken over a 15 minute period. So you can see there are some locations we can identify, but there are degeneracies all over the place. And they're, they're generally rotations about, actually in both cases, you can determine where the X12 vector is here because you can see where the rotations around that are. What I'm gonna do is now add more data as the day progresses. And what you'll see is eventually we are able to break this degeneracy. But again, in the east-west case, we have two locations that are identified. Whereas we use the north-south configuration, eventually the correct point is pinned down. 
Now these maps have a lot more structure than the examples I showed you earlier. There's all these multiple maxima across, uh, uh, across the map. And I claim again, this single integral expression I introduced to you earlier on is actually hiding the structure in there. I can explain that to you, um, but this, this, I'm already running a bit out of time. So let me not talk about that now, but I'd be happy to say some words about that if there's interest and it's also described in our paper. So again, just to sum up this part of the talk, uh, the idea is that this is really just a fundamental aspect. If we think that dark matter is a wave, then we should be able to perform interferometry on it. Now, interferometry, honestly, like to be upfront, will not necessarily help us uh, initially detect a signal uh, uh, of dark matter. But if a signal is starting to emerge, this is an unbelievably non-trivial consistency check that it should pass, that it should have these properties. And then if you're optimistic and we're only years away from the discovery of dark matter, well then going into the future, this will be a really fundamental technique that we'll be able to use to probe the phase space distribution of, of dark matter in a much more sophisticated way than we could ever hope to do with a single instrument. Excellent, let me turn to the, the second part of my talk. And unfortunately, I've, um, I've waffled on a little bit, so I'll go, I'll go slightly faster through this. Or, or, but again, if there's any point that I'm, I'm moving over that you would like to hear more details about, please just stop me. Um, but I, I'll try to at least hit the, the main points here. We've got some so again, questions the, in the chat. Oh, sorry, we've got some oh, questions fantastic. in the chat. But in the interest of time, I, I think it's best that we leave those to the end. Um, because I really want to hear about this next part of your talk. Yeah, OK. No, no, this is my bad. I, sorry, everyone, but I hope, hope to answer your questions at the end. Uh, very yeah, interesting. So this second I, Thanks, Caitlin. Yeah, no, the second idea is let's not even talk about dark matter. Let's just think we have this crazy sensitive axion instrument, which we will have in, in the coming decades. What else might show up? And I'm going to tell you that you potentially could see an axion analog of the cosmic microwave background. But I mean, that, that's very vague. I'm going to try and make that more precise in the, in the next 10 minutes or so. Good, so I just want to convey to you one idea, and that is that, look, you, you will have to and occasionally uh, be optimistic about um, the, the type of cosmic axion background you could see, but if you are optimistic, is there any hope that these detectors could see uh, such a background? And I will show you the answer is absolutely yes. So just as I did for axion dark matter early on, I'm now talking about something else, these cosmic axion backgrounds. Let me introduce a landscape for the, the CAB as I did for dark matter. Now what I'm showing you on the x-axis, instead of uh, the dark matter mass, because I'm now thinking about relativistic axions, because we think of the, the CMB, of course, of photons, which are relativistic, uh, I'm showing you the frequency of those relativistic axions rather than their mass. However, again, this frequency corresponds to some frequency you'd look at in an instrument. And so I'm showing you this over a range of um, frequencies that are being probed by dark matter searches. So dark matter radio on the lower end, cavity instruments in the middle, and then Mad Max uh, um, uh, up the top. And this is just a subset of the many instruments will exist. And actually, again, you can think of the CAB over a much, much broader range of frequencies. I'm just focusing on these ones today because those are the ones that will be probed by uh, upcoming dark matter uh, uh, searches. So for the, the frequency on the x-axis, what do I have on the y-axis? I have a measure of how much energy density is in the CAB at that frequency. So the, the exact uh, definition is given in the, uh, the box on the left-hand side. And actually what we've done here is tried to construct a, a quite uh, close analogy with the gravitational waves literature, which some of you may be familiar with, where you think about the frequency of, of the gravitational waves on the x-axis, and you think about the energy density often measured in units of the critical density uh, on the y-axis. And so that's a, a very close analogy here. So even if you are an expert on that, uh, you may not have great intuition for what do these numbers on the y-axis mean. So let me just place some values here. So firstly, if you had an energy density in axions that was equal to the energy density in the cosmic microwave background, you would live around this, this gray dashed um, uh, line. However, you would also live in a universe that is not our own. Uh, because that amount of energy density added in um, uh, would, would give a very observable modification to cosmology and is completely excluded by uh, measurements for delta N effective. So you have to live below this. Now, what I've shown you in this purple band, you should read H0 preferred as in extreme tongue in cheek. Um, you, I mean, of course, uh, many people are, are aware of this. There is this, this uh, uh, famous Hubble tension between late and early measurements of, of the Hubble constant. Uh, and delta N effective values can alleviate that tension in the following sense. It can move the two central values further apart, but it can blow up the error bars. 
Uh, and so in that sense, you can, you can reduce the overall uncertainty. So there have been paid a lot of discussion about this in the literature. Um, there are probably uh, 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 experts who know far more about it than I in the audience. But the basic I idea I want you to take away from this is not that I think that the Hubble tension motivates um, additional relativistic species around this uh, purple band, more that if you had an energy density around this purple band, it is potentially observable with cosmology because these are giving the type of deviations that you can see uh, uh, at least at the level where we're, we're probing with existing um, uh, cosmological measurements. And hopefully in the future, we may be able to pin down and start to see actual genuine evidence for a non-zero value of delta and effective for uh, example, which is certainly a target of say CMB stage four. So having just given you some intuition, now let me dump a couple of um, uh, uh, models that could live on this space. And I won't spend a ton of time on this because really it's getting into particle physics land of trying to think in detail um, uh, exactly what could have produced these axons in the early universe, what specific models would give rise to these. Uh, but again, if there's interest, please just, just ping me and I can slow down on any one of them. But the first example is the one you would have in mind. Uh, and that is the, the direct analog of the cosmic microwave background. You have axions in thermal equilibrium with the standard model in the early universe at some temperature they decoupled. And then sort of largely independent though of where they decoupled, you end up with a spectrum that is peaked around microwaves. Now exactly the height of that spectrum and the exact peak position depends on the decoupling, but you can see in the inset plot, it's largely insensitive to this. Now this would be the dream. If we could see this cosmic axion background, this would be fantastic. But as I'll uh, try and convey to you, it's challenging. Uh, and so realistically, I don't think, certainly not with the techniques I'm describing to you today, would we be able to get there, or though maybe we, um, some other ideas could that I, I, I can say some more about if there's interest. But because of this, it's also interesting to think what else could populate this space? And this is where the particle physics aspect of this comes in. There's been a lot of discussion about uh, cosmic strings that are associated with axions in the literature because it's very important for this QCD axion scenario. These cosmic strings could generically, they emit axions. They could also emit relativistic axions. And generally they predict a largely scale invariant spectrum. So they could dump axions over an enormous range of frequencies. As you can see in the inset plot here, they could easily produce axions in the parameter space that I'm searching you here, showing you here. Although you need to be optimistic about the, the symmetry breaking scale to get the largest amount of energy density there as possible. Secondly, there's a process uh, called parametric resonance, where if you have some scalar that couples to the axion that is heavily displaced from the minimum of its potential during inflation, eventually when it begins to oscillate, uh, it will dump a huge amount of its axion uh, energy into the axions. There's actually an analogy between the physics that's happening here and a child um, that's going up, on, up and down on a, a, a swing, but yeah, given the time, I'll save you the joke. But the idea is that you can produce a large amount of energy density in axions and it would generically end up with roughly a Gaussian shape. There could be over many frequencies, I'm just showing you one example uh, uh, here. Good, so that's just to say that, I mean, and we weren't trying to be exhaustive in our paper, the particle physicists can come up with ways of populating this space. There certainly could be relativistic axions around here, but of course they can't go higher than this, this um, uh, generically their integrated uh, energy density can't be higher than this, this gray band, which is the CMB energy density. So now let me turn towards the, uh, whether these could be detected. And for this, I note um, uh, just a simple observation and that is that if you live to the left of this, this dotted line I have on the right-hand side here, then you're in the regime where you have more than one state per uh, particle volume, which is somehow measured by the, the wavelength of the states. This means that they're beginning, the states are beginning to overlap and we're moving back into the radio wave or the, the classical wave description uh, of these states again. So on this side, uh, the CAB is beginning to act like a classical wave again. And this is fantastic because we've been thinking about classical waves when we were building these instruments. So it's not gonna be a huge shift to think about looking for a CAB showing up there. Whereas if it really was behaving like particles as the thermal distribution largely is, you need to think quite differently about how you would detect it. So there is a fundamental difference though. And th that fundamental difference is that for the dark matter, as I showed you earlier, because it's non-relativistic, its energy is completely dictated by um, the mass, essentially up to a, a tiny variation. Whereas if we look back on this slide here, you can see that the energy distributions for these states go over orders of magnitude. So it's certainly not just this almost delta function the dark matter was. And so that means if you actually resolved the axion signal in the time domain, for dark matter, you've got this, this signal uh, that's very peaked uh, and the x-axis of both of these plots, I'm showing you nano EV. And I've had to multiply by a million to, see the, the the, to actually see the width of dark matter. Whereas for a generic CAB candidate that I have on the bottom, I haven't had to multiply by anything. It's just very broad. You can just see that it has this generic width. 
And one way of quantifying this is to say that the, the I mean, this is an analogy to resonant cavity stuff, which is, is getting into the, the weeds a bit. But the idea is it's just some way of quantifying how narrow is this distribution. Uh, and so the narrower it is, I give it a larger Q factor. And, and technically for dark matter, I give it a Q factor that is about a, a million. Whereas for a CAB, generically, it's just gonna have an order one width. So it has a Q factor that's about one. And so that leads to a very simple observation. And that is that if the CAB is depositing any um, uh, signal at these instruments, it's gonna be doing it over a broad signal range. Now, as I told you, all these instruments are looking for dark matter, which is like a delta function or a spike showing up in their, their, their frequency spectra. So actually I can tell you that ADMX at the moment, they smooth the, the, the um, signals, they, they, the data that they get and then throw the smooth component out. So at the moment they would just, be, if there was a CAB um, a signal on the, in their data set, they just throw it out. So the first thing to do is to at least don't throw that out and, and look for it. And we've already been in talks with the collaborations and they now, they now know about that. But that's just a, a very simple observation that you can make already at this point. I mean, the more important question is uh, that I want to get to in my last couple of minutes is, okay, is there even going to be any hope that something could be there? And to get to this, I just want to do a very simple calculation to, to parametrically estimate this. Uh, in our, our paper, we go through a much more detailed version of that. And that is that let's just calculate the power that's in the axion field. I mean, it, that, that is the power that we can hope to access experimentally. If that's puny, then we're, we're really hosed. I mean, it, it will be puny, but it has to be puny relative to what we, can, uh, what we are sensitive to. So technically what we want to do here is calculate the power spectral density, which is the amount of power that's in the, the axion uh, 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 signal as a function of frequency. That's what I've done. Um, uh, it's actually a statistical distribution. So I've had to take some average and that's what I've done in the middle of the slide here. Unsurprisingly, it, it depends on the energy density in the field, that's the rho A, and it also depends on the probability distribution of the frequencies, that's P of omega. Unsurprisingly, where you have a, a large likelihood of seeing a frequency, that's where most of the power is. Now, technically, we can't just measure the axion field directly, or this problem would have been solved already. Uh, of course, the, the challenge is it's only coupled to us through some tiny coupling, GA gamma gamma, that becomes squared when you look at the power. And then also, for technical reasons, the axion only comes in with derivative couplings. It's actually a pseudo uh, Nambu Goldstone boson. And so you can't just see the axion, you can only see it through its derivative couplings. And so you get this modification I'm showing you at the bottom here. Now, this is still very general. It has this P of omega there. Let me just try and uh, move towards something that I can, I can uh, uh, do an estimate with more simply. And that is, to, let's just evaluate this expression at the mean of the distribution. At the mean of the distribution, I can evaluate the probability distribution as roughly this Q factor divided by some average uh, frequency, which I need for dimensions. The intuition here is if I have a very narrow distribution, in order for the, the PDF to be normalized, I have to have an enormous value of the PDF uh, uh, because it has such uh, narrow support. And so for a, for a narrower distribution, the, the PDF has larger values, which is why I get this Q factor enhancement uh, uh, that's coming into the expression here. So now I've calculated the power in an axion field, but importantly, I didn't specify whether it was dark matter or the CAB. So now what I'm gonna do is just equate the power in the dark matter field and um, equate that to the power in the CAB field, because I'm building all these instruments that are looking for tiny amounts of dark matter power, I'm going to say if the CAB deposits the same amount of power as dark matter does, then it's detectable. Now, again, this is a very rough estimate. We do a much more careful calculation in our paper, but it turns out parametrically the, the results are identical. So what I do is I just evaluate these two expressions on both sides. On the left-hand side, I have the dark matter density, which we roughly know from um, astrophysical measurements. And the most local of these uh, is actually due to um, uh, Caitlin's work. Uh, and then we also have the Q factor for dark matter, which is this million factor I mentioned earlier. And then the, the, the value of the coupling I'll put in here is whatever value we're going to probe experimentally, like dark matter radio is getting down to these very, very, very small values of GA gamma gamma, which is the coupling between the axion and electromagnetism. For the CAB, I've also put in its energy density and its Q factor, which is roughly one. Uh, but then I don't need its coupling to be tiny. It could be that the CAB has a very large coupling to electromagnetism. Now, maybe that's not what you expect generically, but you certainly can build models where that's the case. And, and for details, I, I, I refer you to some papers on the bottom right. And so this is really where we're going to be able to win. Um, because even though the dark matter density is much larger than this, uh, the CMB energy density, which the CAB must live below, because the couplings we're probing are so far below this star emission bounds, you could potentially probe tiny axion energy densities. Now, there's some technicality. You can see that the Q factor now comes in with a square root. That's because you need to think about the fact that the CAB deposits energy over a, um, a large number of bins, whereas dark matter is just in you know, one frequency bin. But let me put those technicalities aside. 
And so this just gives us an expression. If I know what a given GA gamma gamma limb is, and I just put the, the coupling of the CAB to the star emission bounds, I get a, a prediction for what uh, uh, energy density I can probe. And why this is useful is I can go back to this plot I showed you earlier on, and I promise I'm, I'm in my last uh, uh, minute, uh, and, and just take existing experiments and just whack them straight onto this plot using that expression. And that's what I've done here. I've shown you existing instruments in, in the example of ADMX and Haystack and future instruments, so these are not on the same footing at all, in the example of dark matter radio and, and, and mad max. So just to say, I mean, dark matter radio will not uh, will absolutely be able to reach the, the, um, the relics. I was almost about to say the exact opposite. And so you can see it's absolutely cutting down below the CMB energy densities. Uh, I mean, and admittedly, we've been optimistic here, but even if we weren't as optimistic, dark matter radio would still cut into the interesting parameter space. Existing instruments like ADMX, however, are not there yet, although they will get there in the future. So then let me just flick through this very quickly. I think that this plot, I mean, I'm excited by it. And I'm also very excited about the, the, um, uh, the, the questions that it leads rather than the questions that it answers. And just to say, you can see immediately the thermal case is nowhere near even future instruments like Mad Max. So you need another idea to probe this. There's questions like, could you look in other couplings for this? And then finally, is there some way you can get um, axions above this, this uh, CMB limit I told you about. And to do that, you'd need to produce axions in the late universe. And that, that's a story that I'm thinking about quite closely at the moment. Okay, so again, just the, the, the one summary here is that potentially these dark matter instruments could see something else, and it could be some exotic version of the, the cosmic axion background that I, I mentioned to you. Okay, so apologies for going over time, but uh, just, just to, to sum up here, um, what I've, I've told you about is, you know, for me, I think the next uh, decades are going to be unbelievably exciting, not just for the search for dark matter, but really for the search for axion dark matter. Uh, and hopefully, if you weren't excited about this already, I've given you two additional reasons to be excited, uh, because one, we'll be able to perform dark matter interferometry if we do discover wave like dark matter and actually make realistic plots like I'm showing you on the left. And secondly, I think there could be other ideas uh, for what types of physics might show up these instruments beyond what we even expected. And that's what I tried to tell you about in the example of the cosmic axion background. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much for your attention. Great. Thank you so much, Nick, for a really fascinating talk. Um, real, I certainly really enjoyed it. And uh, I see some, some people clapping uh, in their reactions. Um, so we had a few questions in the chat. Um, so first of all, um, Matthews uh, asks, what kind of instrumental systematics and environmental characteristics can affect axion measurements, for instance, in Abracadabra? Good. So that's a, um, a, a really important question, but also quite a broad question. Um, let me, I mean, I can say, let, I can say two things about this maybe, but I mean, I'd be happy to have a longer, this is a very important question that, I, that there's a lot to say, but maybe just to point out two things. Um, one of these, if you go back to look at um, uh, this, uh, the, the existing abracadabra limits, you can see there is a lot of structure in here, actually. And the theoretical prediction is that, you, that the main noise source here, or the irreducible noise source in these instruments, is just that there is some fundamental uh, uh, background measurement in the squids that are reading out the, the flux that abracadabra, the magnetic flux that abracadabra sees. But this is not at all what we're seeing. There are these peaks up at high frequencies. And I'll be honest with you, we do not know where they're coming from. Uh, so all sorts of things could deposit additional vibrational noise uh, in these types of instruments. And we've tried to shield, um, you can see an earlier version of the, the results were in blue here, and we've tried to shield from that. But, you know, for example, the types of things we found about was that there was some machine in a nearby laboratory that was vibrating at a, a given frequency that had to be sourced for. Um, like radio frequencies can be picked up. Uh, in these types of instruments, and you have to try and additionally shield from that. Uh, essentially, anything that can vibrate, that can move the electrons in the system around, will then cause magnetic fields to be generated that will give you a signal. So th there's really a lot of work to be done here. And this is a parameter space that just hasn't been explored very much. Um, so this is also why these pathfinding instruments are so interesting, because actually, at about 2 nano EV, right in the middle there, abracadabra hit the theoretical noise floor. So it shows that at least in principle, it can be done. Now there's challenges around, you know, we're finding new noise sources that at the moment we don't even know where they're coming from, but in principle, at least it can be done. And just to like say one other quick throwaway comment, uh, for example, if you needed to do this interferometry idea, actually, if you had some uncertainty in the overall time measurement of the two instruments, that would ruin this procedure because you need to um, combine the, 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 the two measurements extremely accurately. 
However, luckily, we're very good at measuring small amounts of time with, for example, uh, atomic clocks. And luckily, we can measure that accurately enough to, to be well below the sensitivity we need for this. But if we didn't have such exquisite timekeeping measurements, actually, you'd be, you would not be able to do this interferometry idea as well. So that's an example of a systematic there that you need to keep track of. But a, a very long story and a, a very interesting question. I see we have some people with their hands up, but I'm going to give priority because in the chat, uh, I, I, I tabled those questions that were in the chat for all, a long time already. So I'm going to go next to Matt Lundy's question. Um, uh, so Matt asked uh, if annual modulation was something that could be useful for the interferometry story. Yeah, 100%. Actually, annual modulation can help you get some information even from one detector. And that is because, um, so what is happening is the Earth is moving through the, the, the dark matter rest frame, and that sets the bulk velocity largely of the, um, uh, this going this way, the, of, of the, the, the axion that then gives the width to that distribution that I showed you. So annual modulation will, when the Earth is on the other side, you get a slightly different value for that, um, that bulk uh, width. And actually, um, uh, the, uh, this distribution will slightly move. Uh, 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 so due to annual modulation throughout the year. And actually then with this, you can make some inference about what direction the dark matter is coming in at from one instrument. It's just, you need a year of data and even then you can't infer it very accurately. Uh, so absolutely annual modulation is something that you can. And if we start doing very accurate measurements there, we will need to include, it's an important effect, but it'll be quite a, it'll be quite a subdominant effect compared to the large order one daily modulations that you would get from uh, interferometry. But yeah, it's an interesting one to think about also. Next, we had a question from Robert who asks if you could explain again, what are the coupling constants on slide 65 and 66? Ah, oh, these are the, the be the specific. No, no, not the specific models. Yeah, good. Okay, thank you, Robert. Yeah, I ran through this quite quickly, and this is really an integral part of this argument. So, let me. I mean, all the the, the constants that that enter are in the single bin line, which is I assume what you're talking about. Um, so let me just run through those those quickly. So on the left hand side, I'm collecting all the relevant expressions. So I'm equating this expression on the bottom left for the CAB and for dark matter, the pi's cancel. And because I'm evaluating them both at a single frequency, the omega bars cancel. So I'm just left with the other terms. So the Q factor is a measure of how um, uh, coherent the signal is, or it's an inverse measure of how wide the distribution is in the frequency domain. And it's critical because it depends, if you look in one frequency, if you have a very frequency bin in your, your analysis, if you have a very large Q factor, most of the power will be in this bin. Um, so this is why it really enters here fundamentally. And uh, on the left-hand side for dark matter, it's about a million, whereas for the CAB, it's about one. Next, we have the energy densities. Of course, for dark matter, we know that's about 0.4 GeV per, per centimeter cubed. For the CAB, it has to be at least nine orders of magnitude smaller than that uh, because uh, the CAB energy density is about 0.25 uh, EV per centimeter uh, cubed, so much smaller. Then finally, the, the critical part, and maybe the part that I, I was much too um, uh, uh, brief on, is what are the couplings that I'm putting in here? So fundamentally, again, if I just have an axion that exists in my spectrum, then the only limits I have on it are these types of star emission bounds I mentioned earlier, like the cooling bounds or the car searches. If I, an axion just exists in the universe, it has to have a coupling below that, at, 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 um, the masses that uh, I was showing. So for the, the CAB, I'll be as optimistic as possible and put the coupling up at that star emission bound. However, what about for dark matter? Well, there I can't sit it at the, 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 um, the star emission bound generically because I'm building all these expensive and sensitive instruments that are pushing that coupling smaller and smaller. But those, uh, uh, couplings only apply to dark matter. So I don't have to apply them to the CAB on the right, but on the left-hand side, I'm putting those limits in. So you can either imagine, you know, for ADMX, I put in their existing limits when, when I did this, or when I was looking at dark matter radio, I put in their projected limits when I was doing that. Those are the values that are going in there. So, you yeah, know, thank you for the, the opportunity to explain that more clearly, because that was important. Okay. And I guess Mohit has had um, the question or their, their hand up for a while and also typed a question. So uh, Mohit, do you want to say your question or either works for me uh, i can ask now ah. so go ahead nice talk nick uh, so i have a, a quick question maybe so what are your thoughts on the existence of an axion star which i'm interested in because it is hypothesized as one of the sources of fast radio burst and uh, in light of this you can actually consider this observation i, I know recently uh, there is a claim of indirect detection of axion emission from the magnificent seven neutron stars. 
So does it change uh, our idea or our views on on them? So okay, let me let me start with the. That's a really interesting question. Thank you. Let me start with the last part of this uh, because I think that it builds into the first part. So I mean. I, this is a long story. So just to give the abridged version, these, as you noted, these observations have seen a hint of an axion. So that is incredibly um, interesting. And if confirmed, it increases my belief in axion stars because then we know that an axion exists. Uh, but then there's been this, you, I don't know if you know, saw this, there was a second paper by, by the same group where they did observations of white dwarfs now there the coupling is different instead of, so for the, the neutron star, you produce it through the nucleon coupling and then you convert it to the, the, the observable photon through the, the electromagnetic coupling. Whereas for the white dwarf, because it's an electron to generate system, you produce it through the electron coupling and then it, um, again, you use uh, the photon coupling. But for generic UV models, you can't tune these things to be arbitrarily far apart. You'd expect them to be close. So if the Magnificent Seven signal was from um, axions, you would have expected to see something in the white dwarfs and they saw nothing. So this also downweight, this downweights my belief that this original discovery was, uh, this original excess was a, a real axion signal. However, I mean, it's still unexplained. My, my understanding is that no plausible um, uh, uh, astrophysical emission mechanism has been presented yet uh, for these. I mean, the, the idea is that these, these photons, x-rays you're seeing are much higher than the thermal uh, temperature, you, thermal distribution you get from um, the axions, the, uh, from the, the neutron stars themselves, sorry, because we can have good measurements of the, the, the surface temperature of these objects. So it's quite bizarre. And maybe it is a, a slightly tuned UV model, or maybe there's some other physics mechanism process that we miss. So I think that's an extremely interesting uh, space to watch. Although at the moment, the second paper slightly you know, poured some cold water uh, on this in my mind. So then going back to your question about um, uh, boson stars, and I put this, the, the later part, because I know much less about this. I mean, honestly, it's an area I'm not as much of an expert on, but I mean, maybe uh, uh, there, there may be um, uh, experts in the audience, but I mean, I would say from what I do understand about it, I think even if, so what people have largely done so far is study the, the, the sort of stable solutions you can get out of these to see if these can be like long lived types of things that might exist in the universe. But I think the real production mechanism for these is, is very much, uh, unclear at the moment. So even if you know such a solution exists, it's not particularly clear how uh, it may have been generated. But I am very much a non-expert on that. So I, I would defer to others uh, on that particular point. Although I just to mention, because I heard this talk, I mean, now that uh, going to conferences is something that's happening again, I was at one two weeks ago. Uh, if people haven't seen, Kafir Bloom has some recent work on looking at strong lensing systems and using that as a potential measurement of the dark matter distribution within these objects. And there is a recent result that at least hints there is potentially a large core component, um, a subdominant core component in these objects, which would be potentially consistent with some sort of enormous solitonic core associated with an ultralight uh, axion. So, I mean, it's tangentially related to what you said. And if you haven't heard about this, uh, definitely have a look. It was really exciting. Uh, Okay, um, I think I saw Matt had his hand up, but he put it down. Maybe he had to run, I'm not sure. Uh, are there any other questions for Nick uh, before we thank him again for a fascinating talk? So any, any questions? Okay, if not, um, yeah, let's, I'll uh, give our thanks to, to Nick with some clap emojis. And uh, I think, uh, because Nick's in Europe, the grad student meeting was moved to lunchtime. So I think Nick is all done for the day. It's probably quite late where you are. So thanks so much for, um, for staying up late to, to tell us about Axions. Really enjoyed your talk today.